This is my Writing with Friends podcast, and I'm your host, A.R. Bazell. And my friends with me, Marcus, Leland, and Sam. Sam is my sister, full disclosure. Guys, thank you so much for joining me for this pilot episode of Writing with Friends. I took down some quick notes about how we could get started. Last year, Ken really enjoyed listening to our writing group chats and he cares absolutely nothing about writing. He enjoys reading and enjoys listening to stories. And so I thought this might be a good way to engage with our audiences. So this is pilot episode of Writing with Friends. I am super glad that Sam had a bunch of writer friends and invited me. I feel like uh, it made me a better writer just in the few conversations that we had during NaNoWriMo last year. Uh, so I thought I would let everybody introduce themselves. And uh, if you want to, you can talk about what you're writing and how your NaNoWriMo went last year. Do you want to go first, Sam? Sure. Um, I'm Sam, and currently I work as a speech language pathologist, so I liked words and talking to begin with. Um, this is Fabio, my data. We can't see Fabio. Oh, can you not? It shows up. Um, oh, sad. Never mind. Sorry. Um, I started writing whenever I was 16 because I got bored one summer and my big sister liked to write. So I thought, hey, I'll give this a try too. Um, and I've been hooked ever since. I have taken a couple of undergraduate writing courses and I've been to a couple of writing conferences in Kachemak Bay. Um, overall, I would say it's mostly been practice and less formal teaching, but um, I think that writing really lends itself to avoiding that like very academic tract. I mean, that's one way you can go, but it's not the way you have to go to be successful. So um, I chose to pursue higher education in a different field. And now that I'm done with that, this is something that I'm pursuing now. So um, last Nano Rango, I think went okay. And my goal was 20,000 words. And I think I hit it, but I hit it like three days into December. And I remember Marcus and I sat down at a coffee shop and we were like, trying to get all those words out <laughs> and we made it i made it i made it in the coffee shop and i had to try really really hard not to cry because i didn't want to do that in public <laughs> it was intense it was a good a great time marcus i'm handing the talking stick off good times um i am marcus um i am also from the uh the nanorimo group uh, it was an excellent time last year, and uh, gosh, the year before really, really is what jammed it into into high gear for me. And that was when I was really like, "Oh my gosh, this is this is really cool." You know, the, just the idea of uh, of critiquing each other's work and, and and you know, just not just screaming blindly into the void, which is what I've been doing ever since I was 11. Oh, I initially started when I was a kid, when I was like 11 years old, I started writing Star Wars fanfic on a typewriter <laughs> and it didn't go very far and it sucked <laughs> shit. And fortunately I moved on from that to just ripping off Starcraft and um, Final Fantasy. And uh, from, you know, just gradually grew from there into into really enjoying aliens and and grand theft auto 3 really solidified what i wanted to write about for me <laughs> that was where i it, the shining haven is essentially it's just grand theft auto 3 i had the realization about that the <laughs> other day when i was just sitting there thinking about it. i was like oh my god this is where it started <laughs> um but yeah I, i've been i've been um uh, an avid reader and writer for uh over 20 years and I'm really enjoying it. If it makes you feel any better, Marcus, I realized that my first book was just feminist Aragon fanfic. 
<laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, yeah. speak the truth, man. I was speaking it loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. And then we have Leland. Uh, so I'm Leland. Um, I was unfortunately not with the group last year. Uh, just too much stuff going on to be part of it last year. But two years ago, yeah, I had a good time too. Um, I've mostly been doing like non-traditional stuff with this group. Um, the two year ago project, I was writing a radio show that uh, was a continuation of a role playing game that I that I did with a number of friends, including Sam. Um, so about, I think like half of it was uh, my writing and then the other half was improv that was transcribed and then condensed into uh, something interesting to listen to. Um, so yeah, not, uh, not quite sure what I'm going to do this year. Definitely, I don't know, for me dialogue is easier, but I feel like I should work on things that aren't dialogue. Um, so I knew nothing about the radio show going into it since I wasn't there two years ago for the writing group. Last year was my first year. So I didn't even know about the radio show until a couple days ago. And when I listened to it, I was like, oh, this is really neat. And I was following along and then I heard Sam's voice and I was like, that's Sam. <laughs> I got the antagonistic interviewer just to defend myself. But it wasn't even at that interview part. Like your voice came on for just a couple seconds before that. You had one or two lines, like maybe five minutes into it or something. And so my husband and I stayed up really late that night listening to the radio show. And it was super cool. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm planning to do NaNoWriMo this year. So last year, my goal was to write 50,000 words of a story and I got 40,000 words in. Um, and I don't remember why I couldn't finish. I think it was because of work. I think working 14, 18 hour days really cut into my writing time. <laughs> So this year, my goal is the same, just write 50,000 words, but I have goals for September and goals for October also. So are you guys doing anything now before NaNoWriMo? Uh, I am trying really hard to live the dream of quitting my very stable and well-paying job that I enjoy most of the time. Um, and being a full-time writer. So uh, that definitely feels like a pie in the sky kind of ambition right now. But um, I wrote a book over the summer and it took me seven weeks to crank out a little over 75,000 words. And I felt like a really cool kid there for a minute. I was like, yeah, Stephen King, I'm coming for you. <laughs> Freaking, it should feel like a really uh, cool kid. And it is absolutely a banger freaking story <laughs> i'm glad you think so because i'm doing a roller coaster i'm all over the place like <laughs> it's fantastic one day and it's crap the next day um but i in my mind i was like oh my goodness i could write up to six books a year at this rate like i was like all into this and then i like had the like i had to recharge my creative battery and at the same time i started back going to work because i get summers off so um that has definitely slowed things down a bit. I also started the process of querying and I haven't sent anything out, but like I started making my batches of who I wanted to query. And, um, but I had to go back and read the beginning of my book again. And I was like, wow, I really want to go back and edit this again, even though I already did once. Um, I would say that the bloom is off that rose. So I'm going to go back and crit critique it this time with, um, without stars shining in my eyes <laughs> and it might be a little rough we'll see how it goes but i would really love to write a whole entire other book between september and december of this year to get to the actual point that's my goal awesome leland what's your goal for this year 
Uh, and for this year, um, I don't know, probably, probably pretty low, like 15,000 words or something. Um, I find it, it's, it's a slow process for me. Um, and I've got, I've got a bunch of stuff going on, so I don't think there's going to be anything happening until November. Um, yeah, so. So you're not planning to do like Inktober or any of those things? You're going to, you're going to wait uh, for November? Yeah, probably. Uh, at least right now I've got a project. I'm going to uh, be doing a vocal recital where I'll be singing for, um, singing uh, 30 minutes of music uh, with a friend who's also singing 30 minutes. So we got concentration on that. So I'm like, I'm I kind of like at the very end of the bookmaking process because I'm doing stuff in like Adobe InDesign for a program. <laughs> uh, I don't I don't think uh, I don't think I'm going to be at that point in writing it anytime soon. <laughs> okay. And Marcus, that's really cool. You're going to do Inktober, right? I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just really. I like to set myself up to have two grueling creativity dump months right in a row. <laughs> I've been trying to, um, I know during October, I'm not going to have time to do any kind of plotting or planning because literally every day I'm supposed to be drawing a picture. Um, they're definitely not all going to be colored, uh, but I'm hoping that they will assist in moving the creative juices and maybe give me some ideas for the, uh, for whatever story I work on. I've been throughout the this month, I've been doing some plotting on trying to figure out what story I want to write and where I want it to go. Um, so far, it's uh, progress is slow, but I'm in it for the long haul. I knocked out a chapter just to see, A, if I could get back into the characters' heads. And it was, it was really easy to do. I was really, really happy. It was, it went, it was well, hit or miss, but it went really well. All, all, all. Um, and now I'm just kind of, in a panicked, uh, nervous phase where I'm like, well, shit, where do, where do I take these characters in this story? <laughs> so we'll see how it goes, but uh, I have a lot of, I hopes. mean, you could stick with the GTA theme and go with GTA five. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to watch a couple of, uh, just like slam through some playthrough videos of cutscenes only just to see how GTA five goes, but it's, 100%. It's the same thing. It's, it's just going to be a, Gar a Hugo and Nirak story with Garland riding side saddle. Um, I'm very, I'm very excited. The first chapter went really well. I was like trying to, it's Hugo and Nirak on a job and they're trying to find somebody and they, Hugo takes off at a run because he spots the guy that they're chasing. And I was like, okay, now who the hell is he chasing? I got to think of, <laughs> think of this. And like somewhere along the way, I was like, oh my God, it's just Garland. He's just chasing Garland. It worked out that really. tracks. Yeah, it worked out really well. Uh, and I was, I was very happy with how it went. So we'll just, now if I can just keep that, uh, keep that frantic pace going, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But I have, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited for this year. I think it's going to, I think it's going to be tough, but exciting. Awesome. So, um, Leland, how are people going to be able to watch your singing recital? Uh, probably won't be doing a live stream or anything, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, it is, it is nice to be able to do things in person again. Like, this recital was planned for early 2020. Mm -hmm. So, finally getting to do my 2020 well. recital. So excited. <laughs> so excited. Years later. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Congratulations. Are people invited to come see you or is it, uh, is it yeah. like just something you and your friends uh, are yeah, doing? Yeah. Uh, talking, uh, talking to friends, getting, getting the word out. Um, so we, uh, we need to finish up a few things this week so we can send out, uh, send out information to, you know, anyone and everyone that might be interested. Awesome. I'm really, really cool. impressed with people who can sing because I can not sing. And I feel like my baby is going to think that all of the little nursery rhyme songs are meant to be like 
in the wrong key because I can't even sing kids songs <laughs> and and carry a tune, but that's all right. So Sam, you mentioned uh, that, you know, you have this day job that you enjoy, but you also kind of have this dream of not needing that day job anymore. And just kind of a general question, do you guys feel like being a writer impacts your day job at all? I can say 100% the other way. Like my day job impacts my writing. Yes. Um, I don't. I don't know how everybody else is, so I can just speak for me. But my job requires a certain degree of creativity, um, because uh, I'm doing essentially behavioral therapy. But my niche is communication, so I have to be pretty creative. And like, my direct time is all very social, and I really enjoy people. Like, I enjoy being social, but I'm an introvert in that like it drains my battery. So I come home and I've got a drained social battery and I've got a drained creative battery and like figuring out the process for how to sit there and recharge to be able to write after work is currently a struggle for me. You seem like you feel the same way, Marcus. Yeah, it's it's very draining. Like every day this week, <laughs> this was a really bad week. Every day this week I get home and I've been trying to like, um, I've been trying to go through um, Sam's story as like an alpha reader and add in commentary. And every day I'm like, okay, I'll just set an alarm for 20 minutes. I'll just sit there and I'll do that for 20 minutes and it'll be, it'll be great. I can do this. And then after that, I'll do 20 minutes of just writing. We could totally do this. And I don't do either of those things. <laughs> I just sit on the couch and I'm like, this is nice. This is so much better. I don't want to go. I don't want to go to work tomorrow. How about you, Leland? Um, I don't know. The, uh, like my, my work seems pretty, pretty different. Um, I do like software development, so it's, it's kind of far away. There's not as much creativity kind of, um, one thing though, I know, um, like a lot of my review skills when I was doing, um, when I was doing alpha reading and other stuff, those kind of came over from stuff I have to do in the software development world. So like those skills I feel like are more likely to be impacted. It's like I spent plenty of time really closely looking at things and figuring out, you know, good advice to say about them. And I can't do that anymore. Yeah. Um, so I'm an auditor and I would say I've never written an accounting character. I should probably do that, but uh, very little about my job carries over into my writing um but like you're saying those review skills like we do peer reviews of pretty much every audit that we do even audits that don't go out the door get peer reviewed to make sure that the auditor's assumptions are good and those review skills get super taxed it's hard for me to do reviews for writing things. And then I feel like also when I read my story after I wrote my 40,000 words, I thought it was terrible. Like it was the worst thing I had ever written. And then I waited four months until I wasn't doing peer reviews anymore. And all of a sudden I was like, I got to the end and I was like, that's it. I didn't write anymore. I was so attached to the characters that I wanted there to be more. And I was annoyed at myself that there wasn't more. <laughs> and then I also have to disclose that I'm writing to my ethics officer. Oh, wow. <laughs> because uh, it could betray the public trust if people think I'm writing while I'm working all it takes is for someone to be like oh you know she's moonlighting as an auditor when you know she's really a writer mm -hmm. and even though that would kind of maybe one day I would love for that to happen right now the auditing is what pays the bills yeah. <laughs> I don't make anything up well, writing and they're a little worried maybe you'll be like the next John LeCar and bring too much from the office into your work 
Yeah. The accountant that came in from the cold. I don't know who John McCarr is, but I'm going to laugh anyways. Maybe that was it. I'm here for honesty. Thank you. Happy day. I dig. All right. Yeah. So is it L E C A R R E? Okay. Um, let me see if I can find a Wikipedia page on John Moore. So his real name is David John Moore Cornwell, and I can't imagine why he would have gone by the pen name of John Lagar. He was a British author best known for his espionage novels. During the 1950s and 60s, he worked for both the security service and the secret intelligence service. Oof. Yeah. Then wrote all those spy novels, bringing his work life into his, uh, per- into his uh, personal work. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I don't know, like, how much vetting they did for him. Um, of, like, the secret, the secret services making sure they didn't do any state secrets allegedly Whoops. oh he's so, just fyi i saw that tinker tail oh, yeah, 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 anyway, never mind. he's it's he's i've heard he's a really good writer i haven't heard him read any of his stuff but i remember that tinker taylor soul it says movie. he died on the 12th of december 2020 but maybe that was just a fake allegedly, allegedly. Are notorious so mm. i'm gonna butcher this guy's name I've seen him all over the internet lately, but I have never heard his name said. But it's uh, Salman Rushdie. Do you guys know who that is? Uh, that is familiar. Is that the Iranian? Uh, yeah, professor? I think he's. Oh, I, I think he's Indian, not Iranian. Uh, I think he's got a British oh. nationality, but. Ethnically, yeah, Indian, he's born. Indian, British. Okay, so Lakar and this guy, oh, that's what I'm Salman Rushdie, they fought over a book called The Satanic Verses. Which Salman and, Rushdie wrote. Yes, and Lakar said, nobody has a God-given right to insult a great religion and be published with impunity. What an old bitch. <laughs> Fuck you, John Lacar. What a what a wiener. Are you fucking kidding me? God. Wow. All right. Podcast number one. <laughs> Let's start talking about censorship. Guys. All right. So what do you feel like is the toughest piece of feedback you've ever got? Like what's the thing that sticks with you or just like crushed you? Let's hear it, Sam. <laughs> oh man okay so there's somebody who participates in our writing group and his name is alex and alex and i traditionally butt heads over everything which is really funny but also telling because i've known alex for years and years and years and i would say that he and i are we have like similar interests but our our ways in which we interpret the world are polar opposites anyways i was i was complaining to him probably six or seven years ago. And I was trying to rewrite my, my very first story because it's definitely like got a, got a soft place, space in my heart. Um, I kept complaining over and over and over and I'm sure he got tired of listening to it. And finally he was like, maybe this isn't just a story you should write. And I was like, Ooh. <laughs> like I can't believe you just said that to me. <laughs> But um, it actually ended up being pretty (laughs) useful advice. Um, I was really attached to the plot that I had written whenever I didn't know what plot was. And so it wasn't very good, to be honest. And I started writing a bunch of other stuff. And I got got passionate about other things. So I learned that, like, one, I'm not just writing to write this one project. I'm writing because I have, like, a lot of stories inside of me, not just the one. And two, it's okay to switch gears and you know I probably took like a five or six year hiatus from the story and I came back this summer and that's the one I rewrote and the plot's totally different the setting's different even the characters have changed a lot but like the 
the core idea of who I wanted those characters to be, I feel like has blossomed a lot. And I don't think I would have been able to get there if I had stayed married to my original idea. Like I was able to let it evolve as I grew up as a person and I evolved as a writer. Yay. That was by far the meanest thing. Like that was it. Like, whew, that was tough to hear. Yeah, that's rough. That's real rough. That's kick-ass how it turned out though. Holy cow. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Sam's Sam's comment was making me think of similar things. So this is again a uh, more writing adjacent realm uh from uh from my uh role playing game running that I got way too attached to a particular character to run. And then the players really, you know, the players, their characters really dislike this character and and, you know, went all out on getting rid of her. And I just had to hold on to her. And, you know, they, uh, like, at least at least one of the people in that group was really not happy with that. And I, you know, I realized <laughs> that this was, this was a while ago, um, like before the campaign uh, that the radio show was about. Um, and realized here, I need to be able to let, let go of the characters and, and, uh, and, there is there is plenty of more stuff out there um you know you, you don't have to you don't have to desperately hold on to the first good thing because then you're not going to have time for the new the new good things um that's that's like my kind of concern with writing is a lot of the um a lot of the feedback from NaNoWriMo 2 years ago um it it felt like I was presenting more refined product than others, which also meant I was spending less time producing things. <laughs> uh, just trying to make something really good as opposed to stepping back and making it good enough for people to be able to talk about it. Um, I just, I'm too much of a perfectionist <laughs> and I do things so slowly. Your work is fantastic though. Like if, if that helps at all. Your work is fantastic. I have I've had very little exposure to your work because you were too busy for NaNoWriMo last year. But mm -hmm. I am I'm very excited to be able to hopefully do the writing group with you this year. And maybe you'll do fifteen thousand words, but I know it'll be an amazing fifteen thousand words and leave us all wanting more. I hope so, Marcus. I still keep pulling for that airship story to make a comment. Yeah, I, that might be the airship thing is what I might continue. <laughs> break the NaNoWriMo rules and continue something. I don't care about rules. <laughs> NaNoWriMo, there are no That's rules. Right. Does anybody else have hard feedback, tough feedback? I think probably some feedback that I got early on um, was that I needed to chill the chill the fuck out basically with the a the number of characters i was introducing into a story and b the number of characters that i would just kill off because there were too many characters <laughs> that wasn't me was it so a lot of okay no no this was actually before this was before you guys um this was when i was this would have been when i was in high school but i had a tendency to what did nelson say nelson said you, there's he's like you know what like there your debts don't matter because you're like in chapter one, like, oh, here's Bob. He's got a cow. And then like six chapters there, like, oh, hey, remember Bob with that cow? Yeah, whatever happened to him? He's dead. <laughs> and then that's it. And you don't hear about Bob and his cow ever again. <laughs> and like, it's like, no, that's that's not the way to do things. I mean, it, I'm sure it works. Like it clearly is working out pretty well for George yeah. R. R. Martin. But like for, for these, I don't have a, a thousand pages to really ingratiate 37 characters who are going to get killed off by the end of the book. I just don't have that kind of that kind of leeway. There's an audio book audio book called The Galaxy Outlaws. And I I used my Audible credit for it because people were saying you should do this because it's 80 hours of audiobook for one credit and so i was like Ooh. i'll give it a try and it was really good but the first few hours really felt like 
a never ending introduction of so many cast members. I got through it and it was fine. But um, when I tried to get other people to listen to it, they're like, oh, I just couldn't get into it. And I feel like, yeah, because the writer introduces so many characters, you have to be the sort of person who will stick with the story through, you know, more than just an hour or two to get to know everybody. The toughest piece of feedback I've ever gotten also came from Alex, Sam. <laughs> Man, he's making a name for himself and he's not even here. <laughs> <laughs> Is he, yeah, yeah, that's uh-huh. My story, it's set in the future in a fantasy galaxy. There's this old timey village where people intentionally try to live like medieval humans lived. One of the things is that this person has a baby and as the baby is coming, the midwives tell the baby daddy, get out of here, you're useless. And so I felt like that was very consistent with, you know, the way those characters would have acted. But Alex really took offense that I used the word useless. And so it was almost like, I got blamed for thinking the way my characters would have thought. And so that was hard for me because I wanted to be like, oh, no, no, no. I I didn't mean that, you know, the baby daddies are useless. That wasn't my intention at all. But it was for my characters to think that. And I think that was consistent with them. But I struggled with that piece of feedback for a really long time. And even now, like when I just see the word useless, I think about that, that feedback I got from Alex. And so, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily like an attack on me, but it really stuck with me that, you know, I got blamed for thinking what my characters think. I do think it's important to note that the punchline to this story is that Alex is a pediatric nurse. <laughs> <laughs> he is. That, real quick, that actually uh, brings up a good point that a lot of criticism, um, this is something that I just uh, recently kind of thought about, a lot of criticism is, comes down to reader preference. Like I have a friend who I like, I had written a, a collaborative story with Sam and Alex a couple of years ago, we were working on like this fantasy story and each of us were doing like a POV a series of chapters. My series of chapters were these two lizard brother and sister and they like all of their, their narrative voice is like choppy, primitive, a little primitive. They don't do any conjunctions. Um, everything is very, like, they're very direct in their speech. And, and like, if the sun is setting, they're like, the sun sets, uh, I am warm or I am cold, it rains, etc. And it bugged the living fuck out of my buddy, Zach, who is, has an English degree, but does not really specialize in writing, is not much of a reader, um, but he enjoys punctuation and grammar and the editing of both. And he was like, what the fuck is this? I need you. He told me, I need you to go back through this and do like a quick run through and like, you know, just tidy it up because it is really rough right now. And I was like, dude, it's not, it's, it's listen, this is the, the, this is where the narrative voice is coming from. And, and he was like, yeah, okay. I kind of see that, but it's, it's still, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know if it works. And um, at the time I was like, oh, damn, you know what? He's probably right. But like in hindsight, there's like a lot of his edits just come down to a place of like, oh, well, this is the way, this is the way that he wants to see it on paper. It doesn't have anything to do with the story. It doesn't have anything to do with the thematic elements of the story. It's all comes from a place of what he wants to see, literally just wants to see on paper. What he really wants to see is a bunch of science stuff and no fiction so i really should have just brought that into mind like right from the get-go okay. but you know it's a learning experience be careful who you ask to for reviews and 
Make sure you ask for the type of review you want. Nothing sucks worse than wanting someone to tell you, like, you know, does this work or not? And then you get back, you know, 2,500 comma fixes <laughs> and no opinion yeah. on the story. Yeah, that's always that's always something. And then, you know, whatever tool you send it to them maybe affects it of like Google Docs. It's so easy just to do those grammar fixes you want yourself, but like that's not what we're doing right now. <laughs> Sometimes just like dealing dealing with paper copies can be better. For sure. What were you gonna say, Sam? Oh, I was just gonna say I've read some pretty egregious accents in my life. <laughs> not to be that asshole, but like I like, I, I, I prefer my accents on the, 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 their seasoning, seasoning. I don't want to read sentence after sentence, like a bunch of intentionally misspelled words. Like, I've definitely read some, oh, some no, books no. where the authors took a lot of liberty with that. And I was like, oh, this is a headache. But what if they wrote their dialogue in IPA? <laughs> and then I, there's like 20 people who are going to read it. <laughs> and two of them are me and you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I buy that. I was just thinking, wait, how do you write a language in Indian Pale? Like, what is this? No, not quite. You're going to be very drunk at the end of that, though. Oh, my God. <laughs> International Phonetic Alphabet. Gotcha. Uh, no, would never. Would never have been done that. that makes you have a to be real drunk stuff. to be able to read it. That's what that's what writing might be. Means. <laughs> I lived a number of years in the very, very deep South. And um, I think that the the county I lived in definitely was poverty stricken. I haven't been back in forever. So it's still I don't know where they're at now. I wrote a story with a true to my experience Southern accent. And everybody hated reading it. Everyone hated it. <laughs> they were like, oh, the story is nice, but it was painful to read your sentences. <laughs> I have some pretty strong feelings about that because accents are something that I deal with professionally. And it is that overlap of like my professional knowledge, but also something that like socially I feel really strongly about. <clears throat> and um one of the core tenets of being a speech language pathologist is you have to be able to recognize the difference in language versus a language disorder. And so accents or dialects are considered language differences. So um, it would, for example, it would be considered the peak of unethical if a speech language pathologist picked up a student who was African American and spoke in African-American English, which is recognized as its own dialect. And I was like, oh my goodness, you've got a language disorder. Let's teach you how to talk like a white person. Um, yeah, that's a great way to lose your license. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I, I like seeing authenticity, especially whenever it's talking about, like, I, I like seeing authenticity in books, especially whenever it's talking about real things. So real cultures, real people, like we aren't, we aren't in a fantasy world. This is real life. And I think I have a little bit more patience for that. But there is a balance to be struck between being authentic to a culture and a people versus maintaining readability. Because the phonetic differences, personally, I like to describe them. Um, so for example, describing a um, East European accent, I talked about how their R's were rolled and you know, the person who was describing the accent didn't know a lot about languages. So she just described like that their vowels were different than what she was used to hearing. And I've, I've done this a few different times, but um, I find that to be my balance between being authentic to a culture, but maintaining re readability. Yeah. And, uh, and that's my speech soapbox. <laughs> I remember with the radio show stuff I was doing, um, it was very interesting, like reading dialogue in other people's works and then reading the dialogue that's meant to be listened to as opposed to read. Um, and it was quite different. And then, of course, um, like I said, uh, uh, with that work, a lot of it was improv that was edited down as audio. 
and just realizing like, man, live speech, you just can't write down it. It, it written, it looks like crap. <laughs> you know, this, this sentence <laughs> has, has like three different things going on in it and six filler words. And, uh, so yeah, it was, it's really weird. Like, um, or not not weird, but interesting operating on three different levels of, you know, live audio that people had and then audio that's polished to be listened to and then dialogue that's written out. Um, yeah, so it, you do, you really do different things uh, depending on where you're doing it. So this is a little bit of a tangent and we can go back to the original topic, um, but... I'm struggling with my writing. I feel like right now, audiobooks are licensed to print money. And I have a lot of dialogue in my stories. And I just do he said or she said. And then if my character is sighing or, you know, grousing or doing whatever, I'll say, you know, so-and-so side, and then I have my line of dialogue. And so when I read my story out loud to myself, it's really annoying to have he said, she said, he said, she said, he said, she said. And I find that I almost want to get rid of it. Like, I want that to go away because I feel like if any of my books ever get adapted to an audiobook, Everyone's going to be annoyed with how many times he said and she said shows up. Uh, well, a, a good narrator knows how to elide over um, those those connections. I can't remember the term for it right now. Um, and then, you know, there is there is an option if you're going dialogue heavy, just, you know, get rid of them for a little while. Just have just straight dialogue, empty di or uh, without any kind of tags, just dialogue going back and forth. And as long as you have like one or two periodically like, oh, so-and-so said this and, and so-and-so replied, then the reader can keep track of it. it, it that's a, a good suggestion. That does clear things up very, it, it definitely tidies the hell out of stuff. If you see it happen too often, can confirm. I use a lot of he said, she said, he growled, she snarled. Yeah, but with your story, I feel like it works really well because you have, you know, like lizard characters and puppy dog characters and Oof, so we just really offended <laughs> fictional people <laughs> it's too late from now on hugo will only be drawn as a puppy character he's a corgi he's a corgi in a suit alcoholic and periodically he pulls, smoker. He pulls out a knife that is bigger than he is and he hacks somebody's head off. i thought he was a dire corgi <laughs> All right, Marcus. This is the darkest time. This is your commission. First day at October. I need Hugo as a dire corgi. I will oh, pay you three dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> it had better be exactly three dollars and fifty cents. I'm write this down, otherwise, God knows I'm going to forget it. Hugo as a dire uh, corgi. Done. I will also I'm accept this as a Christmas Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so that, you know, there you go. <laughs> I I do think for your story, like all of those things help helped me remember what type of. <laughs> what type of character was talking right so like when so i jumped in in the middle right like you had yeah. 12 or 16 chapters already written before i came in and i just started reading the most recent chapter whenever you had it posted and so i didn't know that hugo was a dire corgi <laughs> And I had trouble figuring out what Garland was. And so um, when you put those things in there, it really helped me, like, remind me that, oh, this person is like an alligator with four legs, right? Like, and so it helped me not just default to everybody being human. Yeah. 
So I appreciated the the growls and the snarls and the snaps. Oh, thank you, thank you. And that's you know that's a good point. Like I I purposely what another critique that I had was um, that I put too much action or no uh, no yeah that was a critique from uh, my buddy Zach. He said that I have too much of like he said this and then he goes and does this thing like he gets himself some coffee he replied with this and then he goes and does his thing and so on and so forth apparently i have a tendency to do that a lot i do do that a lot i realize but what i need to focus on is mainly doing it when it's for a lizard or animal character that way the reader kind of gets that oh that's right hugo has a big wolf tail mirak is a skinny snake boy and you know garland has half a face that sort of thing you guys are the dialogue people <laughs> Dialogue. Gosh dang, man. You guys are great. Dialogue Dialogue isn't easy for me. You and Leland, it's just like effortless. And I'm like, I'm going to be here for the next hour. Thanks for waiting. (laughs) Sam did give me a piece of feedback where she said two of my characters sounded like the same person talking. So I had to go overboard to make one of them evil. And it worked out so good for my story. <laughs> She's a petty bitch now. Hey. And you know what? I'm here for it. Like, I'm now ready for her to get her comeuppance just because you had to change your voice. Like, you've added a layer of complexity. Who, the one who left the other one in the volcano? Yeah. That's right. No spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Man, the, 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 that character sucks shit. <laughs> it was, but, like, she lived and breathed on the page. Like, it wasn't just like, oh, this is a two-dimensional character. Like, no. There are layers to this shit sucking. <laughs> it was very impressive. Thank you. So, so now I'm interested in what you did, what you added, what you added or changed about the text to get to get that reaction from everyone because I haven't read it. Um. <laughs> so, basically, I had her be like, I thought I was doing a really good job of making her be fake excited like she's putting on a persona of like this i'm so sweet like happy party girl let's do party drugs and i'm always up for an adventure like i thought i did a really really good job of making her look fake about that and my other character actually is a party girl like she's a risk taker she's an adventurer and so i was trying to make it so that the one character was a mm-hmm. hanger on to the to my sort of pseudo main character. And I didn't do a good job of making her look fake. It just came across as her being uh, like having the same voice. And so then I um, I added like more disgruntlement so in addition to having her be like so excited to go repel down this volcano um i had her complain about everything around her and then i also had her be like get into a petty argument with the main character and then take most of the main character's supplies and leave her on a ledge in the volcano um, that is a one-step process. <laughs> you, or it's, it's, you know, it is multi-step, but it is guaranteed results to completely erase likability from the from, from that character. Like she was immediately her fully own character. <laughs> yeah. So I'm excited for what happens next to her, but I left off before I wrote any of what happens next to her. But I do remember like what I was thinking at the time. So at the time, you know, my pseudo main character has made a lot of really risky um, financial investments, but they have paid off. She is like beyond rich. Like, she could not spend all of her money in a billion lifetimes. Like she is just very financially well off. And so this other character Mm -hmm. is sort of angling for trade secrets, right? Like she's trying to figure out information for Uh a competitor. That's a spoiler. That's, 
I'm sorry. Spoiler <laughs> alert. It hasn't been written yet. It's what I'm here for. <laughs> Shut up, Sam. Why do you think I'm here? I'm giving away the spoilers. <laughs> Didn't we talk about not being John LeCar? John LeCar earlier or something? <laughs> That's right. Uh, sorry. Yeah, going going back a bit, I was going to say it sounds like um, you know you managed to really give the character a voice without uh, changing any of the dialogue tags. Didn't have to be like she said despicably. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't do the the adverbs for how they're talking. I'm mm -hmm. a little bit like like Marcus in that. I have my characters doing things while they're talking. So in a story I wrote, I don't know, maybe 2019 NaNoWriMo, um, I have one of my characters who's on a ship in rough seas on a small round ball. Uh, and he has a board on top of that ball. And he is basically... Cool going in circles around someone by rolling the board and the ball around on a rocking ship. So everything that he says is this person swirled and twirled and circled his arms around. So I, I have like them doing a lot of things while they're talking, not so much like the, the description. I'm not, telling how they're feeling when i say they say something like i try to mm -hmm. let the words speak for themselves the, the dialogue tags are so hard <laughs> and i struggle with yeah. something else too which is distinguishing between when a character is thinking something and when a character says something so i don't know if i just need to get rid of all the places where i'm telling people what my character's thinking like maybe that's lazy writing for me but i have a lot of places where i'm like do i just leave it in plain text should i make it italics like do i put it in quotes but then people are like did he say this this is a great question uh this is something i actually see periodically and I don't know if I have a good answer <laughs> because, because I've just came up with an answer. I was like, fuck you. This is what you're doing. This is all you're ever going to do now. So if so basically if somebody says something, it's in quotes. If somebody thinks something like if somebody thinks to themselves, oh shit, or, oh, I'm going to go and stab that guy in the face later. It's italics. But if it's just like, the narration, like, uh, say the character's inner, honestly, I guess just the narrative voice, like he wandered around the city. Um, the landscape was bleak. They were, there were dead dogs all over the place. Someone sure should take care of these. It's a real, or, you know, something like that. Like all of that would be regular, not italicized. I don't know what the opposite of italicized is, I guess not italicized, but anyway, and then just continue on like with that sort of thing. If, if, it's an observation that's not like specifically, I guess if you could see it being, I don't know how well this is going to sound, but if you could see it being like in the character's head versus what the character is seeing and like thinking out loud, like a conscious thought, um, not thinking literally out loud, but like a conscious thought, then like that's the italics versus non italics. Um, I've so actually really, really struggled with this and, um, I ended up reading a book on writing because I was like, give me concrete ways to improve my writing. And was it on writing? No, although I've read on writing. On writing was more abstract. I was actually specifically looking for like, how do I self edit? What exactly is that process? Because um, everybody talks about self editing and nobody's like, oh, here's what I do step by step by step. So um, I made myself a list because I really like lists. And with my last book, I experimented a lot. I was like, okay, I'm going to try different ways to write from what my character is thinking. And I really, really love interior monologue. I'm just going to, I have married interior monologue. And that's whatever <laughs> you italicize, whatever they're thinking. And you don't add in he thought or she thought. 
and you don't add in any beats. It's just here is their stream of consciousness. Um, and I think it's important to not confuse that with um, point of view. So that, which is what I did. Um, it's really easy whenever you have limited third person point of view. So you're, you're telling the story like as a third party observer, but only from like the shoulder of one person. So whenever you zoom into that a lot, you get very, very close to being interior monologue. Um, and, you know, I can find some examples later if I need to, but um, I, I personally do not default to he thought, she thought a lot. That like external but interior process. Um, I can't remember the name of it right now. Sorry. Me neither. I'm, I'm awful with writing terms. With English literature terms. I know. I should, but I don't. So, Sam, your job is when you read my story, let me know if there are instances where you think I could do like that internal monologue thing and just make it italics and don't say he said, she said, he thought to himself, because I do that a lot. I do that you know, muttered under his breath or, you know, considered, weighed it in his own mind. Well, I don't think the dialogue tags are a bad thing. Um, I think that the hallmark of having very, very clear, distinct voices is being able to go back and forth without having to have dialogue tags. Like that is whenever your character's voices are 100% distinct and nobody is going to get them confused. And Marcus is really good at that. Leland is also really good at that because dialogue is his bread and butter. I'm not so good at that. So I just default to said probably 90% of the time. Um, but Same. I also like to interrupt my dialogue with beats. Um, and that's whenever you add the, he said X, Y, Z while stomping over to get himself a cup of coffee, stomping over to get himself a cup of coffee. I, as I understand it is a beat. And so um, beats are a really great way to one, vary the flow of your dialogue. Cause again, there is a certain element of lyricism involved in writing. Um, but two, it's also a subtle way outside of proper noun said, whatever after your sentence you can say oh james yelled about the comet coming to strike earth while he stomped over to get himself a cup of coffee um, and you don't have to use james because it's that reminder he he's drinking coffee you know he can throw it later if he needs to he can sip it quietly whenever he's accepted his you know impending doom whatever does that make sense i like it so Leland, you said some, you said two things earlier. So you said one thing was that it's like you want to hold on to the first good thing. And then you also said you're a perfectionist. And yep. I feel like perfectionism is something I have struggled with. I don't feel like I struggle with it now because I have a toddler and nothing's perfect anymore except for him. <laughs> That's what I mean. Um, so, but for a long time, one of my old bosses who I love and we're still friends, she would tell me, don't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. <laughs> For you, what does it look like when wanting something to be perfect becomes an obstacle instead of helping you accomplish what you want to accomplish? Uh, yeah, so I think the like the two things I mostly notice are um, like when I'm when I'm polishing the wrong thing and don't know it, you know, the the holding on to the first good thing when there might be better things. And then I just spend all the time polishing the first thing instead of a later thing. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other is, you know, not, not wanting to make a decision about something where I don't necessarily have a good direction, uh, like a good direction to advance with, but, 
you know, as long as I advance somewhere, then I'll be in a new place uh, and then can probably start getting stuff working from there and then come back to the place that, you know, was quite a rough spot. Um, so like, I know, I know what the solutions are. It's more like kind of making them happen. <laughs> that's, that's really good advice. As soon as you said that I muted myself so that I could furiously type and <laughs> start typing that out. Is this, that honestly, I had never, I had never thought about that before. Uh, I'll get stuck getting into like, like getting your bike stuck in a rut or something like i'll just start being like oh shit oh, i gotta keep on working this and sometimes i'll abandon a project because i can't get any farther in it that's a really good one. that's really yeah good. that's that's <laughs> that's probably a third thing of of you know once once i do have a decision made and you know i think it's good yeah how, how much do you really need to polish this thing that you know at what at what point can you just say it's it's good enough um, it, it still feels weird with, um, with writing, with writing and, um, like the radio stuff, you know, producing stuff for a mass audience. It's like, you put a ton of time into this and then, you know, it's like, there has to be a mass audience for it to be, you know, for like the time value to make sense. Um, but also it's like you, you also have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to do it anyways. <laughs> yeah. Um, Craig Allenson is a self-published author. I think he was in software design or something. And now he just writes and RC Bray does the narration. He did the Martian. Um, and so Craig Allenson makes like enough money that he doesn't need a day job. Right he's living our dream and when i read his ebooks i get so annoyed by the skipped words and the missed words and the misspelled words and sometimes he talks about like a character so in the last book i read on kindle um he talked about a character passing out t-shirts to everybody, but that character is not on the ship at the time. That character is on a different ship leading her own ship. And so he's this super well-known author and you just kind of expect a little more perfectionism in his work, but consistency, he doesn't even have to do that, right? Like his books sell themselves at this point because, well, R.C. Bray is a huge part of that. He R.C. Bray brought his books to life and in an amazing way. Um, but he has such a large following of people and they love him so much that they forgive him for for the things that are imperfect. Like he has the best fans in the world. You know, like I think if Stephen King published a book with that many typos, like they would eat him alive. <laughs> I mean, on the other hand, he did do The Dark Tower, which was fucking insane. And one of the, like, like it was, the, the fact that he got away with it is, uh, I don't know. I don't have a good, you know, I shouldn't have brought it up. I don't have a good thing to say here. It was very, it was very, I loved it. You know what? Never mind. Um, I couldn't get into The Dark Tower. Really? Did you do it? Read? Were you able to read any of them or no? I read the first one. Um, that's fair. Yeah, they they're they are very mind blowing. It's like each one cracks the world open a little more, and it's just by the end of it, you're like, what? What even? It's it's very the, the stuff that he does in there is very ambitious. Um, it's not anything that I would ever attempt to do just narrative narratively speaking the amount of meta shit that's in there is out of control it's it's insane it'd be like if um while watching a marvel movie ready know, player I guess one Deadpool does that too <laughs> yes very it would be like if during ready player one they opened up the tv screen and said hey are you guys all you guys are all good you're enjoying the film okay just keep on watching <laughs> and uh went on from there anyway it's incredible but have uh, uh, have any of you read any Jasper Fjord? 
Yeah, he did the Thursday Next uh, series. If you want, if you want an incredible amount of meta. <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy meta. I did not read the Dark Tower <laughs> series, so. It says he wrote uh, two books in the loosely connected nursery crime series and the first books of two other independent series, The Last Dragon Slayer and Shades of Grey. I feel like of those, I would probably read The Last Dragon Slayer. I don't know what nursery crime series means, but it terrifies me. Yeah, I, I haven't read his nursery crimes. Uh, those are... Uh... Those are like occurring in the world of of nursery tales, and oh, okay. And I think I think you know it has kind of a British policeman feel in it, which is kind of you know counterpoint to that. Shades of Grey is pretty good to kind of get a feel for what his writing is like. That doesn't have a very meta uh, a very meta aspect to it, but it is kind of a downer for reasons. <laughs> Four reasons. So yeah. Shades of Grey, <laughs> The Road to High Saffron is a dystopian novel, the first in the Shades of Grey series. The story takes place in Chromatica, Chrom Chromatasia, I'm not sure, uh, an alternative version of the UK wherein social class is, is determined by one's ability to perceive color. Someone else had a book about color. The Giver. The Giver? It's not what I'm thinking of. The Giver was the Giver was like only one person can see color at a time. And when he gets old, he dies and gives his gift to someone else. That does but, sound yeah. familiar. I feel like I'm thinking of something different, though. Did Brandon There's Sanderson this. write a book about people with color magic? Is it Warforged? Warbreaker. That's right. It's Warbreaker. How could you forget? All the Brandon Sanderson fans will come with pitchforks <laughs> after us. The Brando Sando <laughs> Hive will be like, whoa, we gotta we gotta defend our prince. That's right. And I'll be like, listen, listen, guys. Just color us Shalon at the end of Way of Kings. I'm just here counting my heartbeats. Okay. Just count my heartbeats. There you go. I don't want to come for this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, that is such a dumb thing to say. I'm sorry. I like oh, it. God. I'm I'm here for but... it. Um, so tell me what book you thought it was before. Um, oh, I'm still my I'm still looking at mine. The Giver is a 1993 American young adult dystopian novel written by Lois Lowry. It is set in a society which at first appears to be utopian, but is revealed to be dystopian as the story progresses. The novel follows a 12-year-old boy named Jonas. Society has taken away pain and strife by converting to sameness, a plan that has also eradicated emotional depth from their lives. Jonas is selected to inherit the position of receiver of memory person who stores all the past memories of the time before sameness as there may be times where one must draw upon the wisdom gained from history to aid the community's decision making and for Jonas struggles with concepts of all the new emotions and things introduced to him and whether those things are inherently good evil or somewhere in between or if it is even possible to have one without the other the community lacks any color, memory, climate, or terrain, all in an effort to preserve structure, order, and a true sense of equality beyond personal individuality. I mean, this does sound like a utopia if you're an auditor at heart. <laughs> Listen, do you have no soul at all whatsoever it's like the purest form of the auditor like if the next step down was the blankness of all existence this would be like you know next tier up you're like okay this is good enough this is good enough for like a like a anyway man yeah there's i, I haven't read the book in like 20 years but there's a distinct scene in there 
where this it, he's just gotten the gift and he's walking down the street and he sees this kid tossing an apple and he looks at the apple and he sees that the apple is red and everything else is black and white and he's just like what is happening <laughs> oh really cool uh i stepped away for a bit to remember the name of the the color magic novel that i i read recently uh uh, Nocturna by Maya Montaigne. Uh, it's it's like high fantasy, um, high fantasy, and then a YA fiction, uh, which is, okay. which is interesting because it it kind of cemented for for me what YA fiction is. You know, I haven't like read Hunger Games explicitly or something. So, so. Amazon says Nocturna is only book one. It says it's the first in a sweeping and epic debut fantasy trilogy set in a stunning, stunning Latinx inspired world about a face changing thief and a risk taking prince who must team up to defeat a powerful evil they accidentally unleashed. Perfect for fans of some other work. And it says, to Finn Voy, a character, magic is two things, a knife to hold under the chin of anyone who crosses her and a disguise she shrugs on as easily as others belong cloaks. As a talented face shifter, it's been years since Finn has seen her own face and that's exactly how she likes it. But when she gets caught by a powerful mobster, she's forced into an impossible mission steal a legendary treasure from Castellan's royal palace or be stripped of her magic forever. That sounds good. I might try it out. I, um, I enjoyed it. Um, it was, it was fun. Um, I guess thinking about it a little bit here, um, like everyone, everyone has unique magical powers, which is a fun way of going about it. And then color is very central to the prince character. Um, in a way that I won't get into. Um, but yeah, it's so I guess like high fantasy, like X-Men. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's pretty cool. It that. sounds cool. And I've been reading the Dritt Stewart books because I, I was just waiting for book threes to come out of like half a dozen different trilogies and I'm like I'm going to go back and read something that has a nice back catalog can I, can I complain for a second are you going to complain about the way I said Dritt Stored no. okay then yes you may complain <laughs> I'm going to complain about the book series I just finished uh, called The Deeds of Paxnarian and it's a fantasy novel series written in the 80s and it was by this woman who she lives in texas now and she uh, was a marine and so i was like really feeling my like fantasy like military life and so i found this book series and i was like this is it this is the yeah one. i'm gonna get my whole like medieval military life on what do you say Marcus? oh no <laughs> just like yeah pump, pumped up <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Anyways, I loved this series. Like, it was so D and D. Like, I was here for it all the way up until the very end of the last book, and it had hands down the worst ending I think I have ever read to any book ever. <laughs> and I almost finished the Inheritance series. I want you to right know that I read back. all of those books <laughs> so that I could talk to you about them when you were a child. I have tried multiple times to finish. Uh, the Aragon series, and I cannot make it to Inheritance. Like, the first book had so much promise, and he just lost the threads by book. I like to talk about a bunch of different things, so. <laughs> Anyways, I'm still mad about this book series, but I started rereading um, The Novice Dragoneer by E.E. E. Knight, and it's beautiful, and I love it, and I'm here for it. E.E. E. Knight was an author you introduced me from. He wrote Dragon Knight. Yeah. Um, anyways, great book. I just finished the first one. Uh, I, I was going to say at least um, I read, I finally finished um, because she also finished um, the Green Bone Trilogy by Fonda Lee, uh, which starts with Jade City. Um, so that's like a modern, 
modern fantasy and it's also like big family what mm -hmm. i guess uh george rr R. martin is like but the whole thing the whole thing it was just tight action the entire time and the ending was amazing it just it never mm -hmm. petered out and she actually stuck the landing at the end where it really felt satisfying but also like this story is very done and you know there's there's still a world but the world is going to have a new story because also it's like the new generation is coming into power anyways <laughs> so goodread says the jade city by fonda lee is a gripping godfather-esque saga of intergenerational blood feuds and that's the first in the green bone yes. trilogy Nice. Okay. So Goodread says the Jade Setter of Jan Loon is book point zero five. Oh, there's a new one now. Okay. Well, that's that's one that I didn't know about. <laughs> I just know like. And it was okay, published yeah. in 2022. Well, so that I is guess the new I one. finished Ooh. the trilogy, but not the series now because there's more of there it. There you go. A little prequel, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Definitely this, the story that set up the world that the book existed in was also interesting, like guerrilla warfare with magic, um, uh, trying to take back, take back an island nation from, uh, from colonizers basically and succeeding at it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was all just the setup and, and, you know, it was mostly talked about from like people that were. 80 years old that's interesting. Right. That's something that's cool. I agree. yeah i really i really like worlds like that where you can tell there's so much depth but the author isn't going to bother isn't going to bother you know boring you with it but you can you can tell that it's there to dive into even if they didn't do that that's really cool so on that note what tools do you guys use to keep your world building straight in your own head or in, you know, some software that you use on your computer? That's a good question. I have, <laughs> so typically, I have a Google Docs spreadsheet, or not a spreadsheet, it's just a regular document, but it's long, goes on for a while. And then I have a map. I have I have stuff. I have a uh, stuff kind of spread out a lot over my computer just because I never did a good job of compiling all of my brainstorm stuff slash world building stuff. I have one big document that I've been working on just kind of putting everything into there and, and making sure that I have every like, oh, there's different neighborhoods in the city. There's different races um, and there's different, all these characters, these different factions. So for the most part, I just have everything in a big Google doc and it's slowly coming together little by little. I really need a spreadsheet. I don't know why I'm still with messing around with this Google Doc. But, it, you know, it's working for me, though. So I've tried using Scrivener. Have you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. They give a big discount for NaNoWriMo winners. Um, nice. The problem I had with it is portability. So I used it on one laptop. And I thought I had saved everything and exported it correctly and pulled it up on the new laptop and it's not there. I'm missing, I don't know, 63,000 words Ooh. of the story. Oh. I would be upset. <laughs> oh. uh, it hurts me so badly. <laughs> I've been toying with using Microsoft OneNote and I like uh, Google Docs, it's fine, um, but the search function in Microsoft OneNote is so freaking good. <laughs> like, really? yeah. So, if anybody's interested, we could go over, you know, Microsoft OneNote, or I can do a video on on how I use it and what it looks like. But it. It just works really, really well for me. Uh, 
Leland, Sam. I will go. I will come out and say it, and I will not be ashamed. Um, I don't really world build in the traditional sense. Like, I make it up as I go along. Like, if I need there to be conflict, oop, that goes back 300 years. So we just found out. <laughs> <laughs> I have a little journal <laughs> I write it down and I'm like oh shit these people have been enemies for 300 years whenever you go back and edit make sure that's consistent <laughs> that's how perfect. I will build <laughs> perfect that's good that's good yeah, I'm I'm similar you know the those those tendencies to like hold on to the good the first good thing and also being extremely annoyed uh like Amanda about continuity errors, like it just doesn't happen that much for me. So I want to try to get away from, get away from that and let myself make those mistakes a bit more, but also, yeah, it's, I want to be, I want to mostly be discovering the world. Um, I think a lot of it is from the role-playing games I run. Uh, and especially like, uh, the one thing I do find useful though is, uh, like writing out a dramatis personae. Um, there's there's uh, one particular uh, role-playing game, uh, Blades in the Dark, that does a very, very good job at leaving just enough information to play from each character. And then like my my uh, dramatis personae end up being a little similar to that, to that format. Just write like a few adjectives about each character and then like some uh like a sentence or two of like what's their deal you know they want to do something mm -hmm. uh so that's that's about the extent of it and then i don't know i think partially i haven't had any work large enough to have it become that much of an issue that's what i was gonna share is that that's the way my book one is right so when i write that first book I'm discovering things. Um, the, the one that I wrote in 2019, I get through the, the whole story and at the end, all of a sudden there's magic. So like my prologue to my story starts out with this like weird dreamlike sequence. And then, you know, as the story goes on, it just seems like something a little girl dreamed up. And then at the end of my book, it's like there's magic in this world and it's coming back. And that thing that happened to her when she was five was real. And she finds out it's happened to other people. And like they've all explained it away with natural sounding events. But now that I have book one written, I feel like I, I need some way to keep that like... They use specific words. Like when I was doing the writing, I just Googled, how do you say this in Swahili? And that was the word for, you know, jellyfish, right? Or, or the color purple. And like, Definitely. now that I've done that in book one, I, I need to keep that sort of stuff straight. <laughs> Uh, if I'm going to write book two. So I think I'm definitely like a not really so much a world builder as so much as like I'm using it to keep my story straight, like remembering the things I, I made up. Yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. I feel you on that. Half of my notes, like most of my stuff is just like a thing for each character. And it's just like what their eye color is, what their hair, what their scale color is. If they have uh, scars or, or that sort of thing, it's just all stuff. So that I think they're like, Oh shit, what color are his eyes? I can, or her eyes. I can go back and be like, Oh, there we go. Really interesting because my like continuity errors, like aren't about like details about the characters. Like I just remember that it's plot stuff. It's like, do they know this? Do they not know this? Like, did they have boots on in the scene? Did they not have boots on in the scene? Like, I, I, <laughs> punch, I like frame one of my character stories in my last book because she starts at the beginning and like she knows a lot about writing courses, even though she's like 
poised to take over control of the city and she's been very sheltered. And then at the very end, she's like ready to jump on this horse and go riding all the way back to her city, even though they've ridden this horse nonstop. And I'm like, one, would she be able to saddle this horse by herself? Two, saddle sores, hello, like, what? <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Like this poor <laughs> horse has to be like superhuman. Um, it's it's like that, like, it's the small stuff. It's the plot stuff. The do they or do they not already have this? Because all of a sudden they're going to start pulling stuff out of their Mary Poppins bag like crazy. So I don't know if you guys remember, but for last year's NaNoWriMo, I did this crazy thing that like nobody had heard of and I got AI generated art for my for each of my characters. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? And I put the pictures in my stories at the beginning uh so that like I had a picture of what each of my characters look like because they're all related, so they're all families, so they all have dark hair, dark skin, dark brown eyes, like, <laughs> you know, the normal, oh, her dark hair flowed in the wind, right? Well, there are seven of them with dark hair flowing in the wind. <laughs> uh, so I needed some something to help me pick up on little characteristics that would distinguish them from each other without being, like, characters right like sure i can have somebody with a giant axe scar across their face right like my my little Tyrion. <laughs> that, oh, I, have no I found that ai generated art super helpful and now everybody is talking about ai generated art and people are like oh this is the new way to do art and real artists are like no ai is not real art and Word. <laughs> uh, everybody's coming for me today. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not coming for you. I would like to say thank you to everybody for coming to my pilot episode of Writing with Fred. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, it was a lot of fun.